All right, we are live. Good morning, everybody. Back with you here for uh, our latest episode of Ask the Agronomist. On a very busy June 3rd morning. Um, wish we didn't have quite so much work to do on June 3rd, but uh, we got a lot of planters rolling in uh, certain parts of the state, sprayers rolling everywhere, replanting going on, some crop going in for the first time yet. Uh, if you're uh, if you're in the forage business, you probably have not had an opportunity to get your first cutting of hay up yet. There's uh, still rye to be chopped, uh, lots of lots of activity. I got a couple seeding projects at home that I haven't been able to do yet. Say you're not supposed to do seeding in a month that doesn't have an R in it, but the R months are gone for a while, so we're we're going to give it a go anyway. So um, just kind of a little update on uh, you know what we see going on in the territory. Uh, if you uh, haven't been able to finish planting yet, hopefully this is the week that you get wrapped up with planting. Looks like we've got a pretty good window here till my forecast says till next Tuesday, supposedly is, uh, is warm and dry. We'll see if that holds uh, here in West Central Illinois. We, we, we don't miss many rains and we have a few that appear that uh, weren't in the forecast. So Hopefully that's a trend that continues in July and August when we, uh, when we really need those rains. You, you, know, you want to be careful wishing it would quit raining, but uh, I know some of you have been doing that so, uh, so we could get wrapped up on planting. But uh, there's uh, you know, quite a bit to see out there. There's uh, you know, a, lot of, uh, a lot of really tough planting conditions in May again, and, and that's something that we might spend a little bit of time talking about is two, two years in a row now, um, the worst time to plant corn uh, is what's arguably supposed to be the best time to plant corn, and that's early May. Uh, so we've had a couple really rough Mays for getting corn established, and um, that's really making it challenging for people who plant beans first, or people who can't plant both crops at the same time, or people who are really particular about soil conditions, weather forecasts, and putting their corn in a ideal scenario. I've got a neighbor that planted a field of corn about 10 days ago, and it is maybe the only field of corn that I have seen this year that emerged quickly, perfectly, uniformly. Uh, I, I have to go back and look and see what day that actually got planted, but it would have been late May sometime. And uh, that corn was up in a week and you could just see every spike down the row was the same size. Uh, just beautiful, beautiful emergence. And I, I haven't seen that out of uh, virtually anything that's been planted this year. The stuff that went in early looks really nice, but it you know took a while to come up, didn't come up as evenly as, uh, as we sometimes like. Uh, there were a couple planting windows in, in April that were pretty good. Um, you know, May got really wet for a lot of guys and had a lot of ponding, we had a lot of um, you know, fields that either needed to be touched up or in some cases completely redone in certain geographies. Uh, Adam was telling me Southern Illinois and, and across the river from him into Missouri, uh, there was a, a lot of corn that went in in that May window in places and uh, received a lot of rain. And, and really it hasn't been temperature uh, that's been the issue, it's been moisture. Um, you know, we've been cold, um, and so we didn't get a lot of heat unit accumulation, but just prolonged saturated soil conditions, and it's just it's just so easy to suffocate that seedling right after planting uh, before it's had a chance to get out of the ground. I think we talked about that a couple weeks ago here on Ask the Agronomist as far as what is able to hold its breath the longest, and uh, the thing that is able to hold its breath the shortest amount of time is a newly planted corn seed. So if you had the misfortune of putting corn in the ground uh, right ahead of a two or three week prolonged wet period uh, and you've got poorly drained soils, you know, that outcome's not going to be good. Uh, I know some of the guys that uh, chose not to plant or hadn't been able to get done planting, they didn't feel good about their fields that weren't planted. But when they looked at some of their neighbor's fields that did get planted, that need to be fixed um, that made them feel better about not having theirs done yet. So, but it's been, uh, it's been a tough, uh, tough challenging year for, uh, for planting and uh, hopefully we have a good spray season. Uh, we've got several topics we're going to touch on today related to herbicide applications and some things that we're seeing and um, a few other uh, agronomic topics. And, and as always uh, chat in your questions, if you can log into YouTube with your YouTube account or your Google account, 
if you're not comfortable chatting in a question, you can text a question to uh, my cell phone number up here. I probably won't get it live because I'm not monitoring my phone, but uh, if you want to send me a question later, there's my cell phone number, there's my email address. I always do get uh, a few texts and emails after each one of these episodes. And we always use that information that comes in as, as fodder for uh, for next week's episode. And um, if you uh, if you do have a, a question, please uh, don't be bashful about asking. That to me is what makes Ask the Agronomist unique is I don't necessarily come in with a pre-prepared uh, presentation or anything that I particularly feel like we have to cover today. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have material to fill if we're not getting a lot of live questions chatted in. But uh, love the live questions, love the interaction with the audience, and, and that's really what we're trying to accomplish here. So I uh, also want to uh, thank our uh, friends at Yetter Manufacturing here at Macomb for allowing us to use their facility. Again, uh, really works nice for us. I've got uh, producer Adam and producer Jennifer here with me this morning, uh, manning the chat and, um, and, and helping me with all the technical things that if you know me, I'm technically challenged. I, I've always jokingly said that the term, you know, the word technical is, is in my title. It needs to have quotation marks around it when it, uh, when it comes to me. So anyway, with that, uh, Adam, uh, any, uh, any uh, opening questions? Yeah. So I was having a conversation uh, the other day. We're getting into June, obviously, beginning of June. So yeah. uh, some corn being planted still and a lot of beans being planted in some areas still. And one question that I had come up from with a grower that we had a good conversation about that he would like us to, to touch on is, why is it that we get later in the spring and in the planting season that we need to think about upping our soybean population, oh. increasing our soybean population? Okay. Yeah, no, good, good question. So, so the, <clears throat> You know, soybean population is a, so, so many things we talk about are, are kind of a, a a spider web. You can go a lot of different directions with it. Um, you know, there's debate about what is the right soybean population to begin with. And then there's further debate on when we should start increasing that population and to what degree should we increase that population as we get later in the season. The basic reason why we recommend higher seeding rates for later planted soybeans, same reason we recommend narrow row spacings for later planted soybeans, if you can do that, is that we typically expect to get less vegetative growth. Those soybeans will be shorter. Those soybeans will have fewer main stem nodes. And it is your main stem nodes that are your primary potting sites. And if you've got fewer of them because the soybeans are shorter, you're gonna maximize your yield potential by having a few more stems in the field to set those pods on. So, you know, we could debate, you know, where the baseline seeding rate should be for soybeans, but whatever you think is right for you is, is okay there. So wherever you're typically at, I recommend after we get into June. So basically at the end of each week, as we go through June, I would recommend increasing your seeding rate somewhere around 10 or 15% on soybeans each week as we go through the month of June. So if you're at my typical 140 and you increase 10 to 15%, you're gonna add 15 or 20,000 seeds to your population each week through the month of June. When you get into double crop timing, which is late June, early July, you know, really the ideal seeding rate is probably whatever your budget can afford. It is really difficult to get soybeans too thick when you're planting them in that double crop timing. Um, probably need to be somewhere 185,000 plus by the time we get into late June, early July. And you know, if you can, uh, if if you're, you know, if you can go higher than that, you know, higher the better as we get later because those soybeans are going to be really height challenged and you're not going to get a lot of uh, main stem nodes on those later planted beans. So. As we get later, you know, and I would say we are getting to the point where I start to recommend increasing seeding rates in soybeans, usually somewhere around June 5th is when I tell guys to start bumping that rate up. Soil type makes a little bit of a difference. The maturity of the bean makes a difference. If you're stuck with some, plant some group twos in June because you didn't get your group twos planted early and you've got treated beans that can't be returned. I was in that boat in 2019, planted two sixes on June 10th. Um, I, I crank my population up a little more if, if you're planting those early beans. Um, and if you're planting a bean that's a shorter statured bean, 
if you're on lighter soil, you know, a lot of the factors that we consider when we look at soybean populations, uh, there might be some situations where I would get a little more aggressive at cranking that seeding rate up. But um, to answer your question directly, Adam, I would say starting at the end of the first week of June, so somewhere around June 5th, um, I would start bumping about 10 to 15% per week on your seeding rate. Um, unless you're, a, you know, if you're a guy that's an ultra low seeding rate guy, there are a few folks out there that are dabbling with some 100,000 seeding rates. If you're at the low end of, of typical, you know, I'd probably bump it a little harder, a little faster, and a little sooner. But assuming that you've been somewhere around 140 for your standard seeding rate, uh, I think that's a good spot to start ratcheting that rate up as we go through the month of June. Yeah, I uh, I agree. <clears throat> Definitely a lot of good reasons to try and increase those seeding rates here as we get into June on soybeans in particular. But what about corn, Lance? So so corn, I, I look at it a, a little bit just the opposite. And there's so many ways. It's it's all it's ironic. I, I like irony. How corn and soybeans respond almost completely differently to population. Um, always it seems. Um, you know, on soybeans, we want, you know, the better your soil is, the lower we want your seeding rate. Um, the earlier you plant, the, you know, the lower we're probably going to recommend you drop for population. Uh, the later you plant, we're going to crank it up. With corn, you know, we tend to look at more of a yield goal uh, basis on our seeding rate. And frankly, if you're planting corn, you know, in early June, we probably need to assume that we're going to be somewhere less than 100% yield potential on that crop. We've had a couple of years here where June planted corn has done very, very well. It hasn't necessarily been the best, but the yield gap between April planted corn and June planted corn has been pretty small. But, you know, personally, I'm going to assume that, you know, we probably can dial back that yield goal a little bit. And, you know, if your yield goal is now 180 or 200, we don't need to be dropping 36, 37, 38,000 seeds to, to get there. The other thing that makes me pull back a little bit on seeding rates on late planted corn is we know it's going to be pollinating and trying to uh, fill during a more stressful time of the season when it's most likely going to be hotter and drier than it would have been had it been planted in April. That's the primary reason that, that late planted corn tends to yield less is it just doesn't have as good of conditions, you know, during pollination and grain fill. So that's another reason to take a little bit of the pressure off those plants. So I'm probably going to drop, you know, maybe 10, 15, you know, maybe if you're a real high seeding rate guy, maybe 20% lower seeding rate if you're planting late versus what you would have used planting in April. Um, you know, you're also going to, you know, have to be careful assuming this because there's a lot of May planted corn that went in perfect conditions and had good soil conditions and, and good warm soils and we still didn't get a great stand. But, you know, hopefully corn that gets planted in June gets off to a good start. You got a nice stand. Um, you know, we don't need to compensate for uh, any, any tough emerging conditions. So generally speaking, I'm going to recommend a, a little bit lower rate for late planted corn than I would have early planted corn. Yeah. And I know earlier you're giving a little bit of an over, overview of what's happened this this uh, planting season so far and a lot of the planting season is behind us. Uh, for most of us here in West Central Illinois, some of us have struggled more when we had uh, to plant especially corn and beans too. Mm -hmm. But around that Mother's Day window, I was having right. a conversation with a girl the other day that it's kind of funny. We were kidding. It's like for two years now in a row, right. I think it's a sign, Lance, that when yeah. it's Mother's Day or yeah. Mother's Day weekend and the forecast doesn't look good, you should just go be with your mother yeah. and stop planting corn yeah. right around that weekend. Yeah. It really it, seems to be a tough one for us the it, last couple of years. It, yeah. It, uh, you know, I, I thought it was tempting fate too much to be planting on Easter Sunday. Uh, that worked out pretty well <laughs> for people. Uh, planting on Mother's Day Sunday did, uh, did not. So... The, uh, and, and Adam's right, two years in a row, we have been hit with a really wet mid-May. And, and that's that right after planting that I was talking about a while ago. The, the worst thing you can do to corn is put it in the soil and then saturate that soil right after you put the seed in the ground and then keep that soil saturated for a prolonged period of time. 
if you do that, it doesn't matter if you plant in March, April, May, or June, you're going to have problems. So it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the fact that it's Mother's Day, and, 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 unless unless fate is uh, is involved. Um, but but I, I'm going to blame the weather rather than fate. But if if you if you want to blame fate uh, and and be with your wife and and your mother uh, on Mother's Day, you know there's probably other benefits to that as well as not having to replant corn. But uh, yeah, Adam's right. There, there's. You know, I had May second planted corn, which wasn't Mother's Day. That I replanted about fifteen percent of the field, just in the in the wet areas. Um, I know May sixth, seventh, eighth has been a really bad planting window. Um, you know, my neighbor I mentioned earlier that planted corn. It was probably more like May twenty fifth. I'm guessing something like that. That was a really good May window, as it as it turns out. Um, and, and this whole broader topic of, you know, you know, we, so, some of us actually promote planting corn in, in early May. And, and that's because we've been kind of focused on planting soybeans early. And, and sometimes if you're planting soybeans early, that means you end up planting a little more corn into May. And if you hadn't been planting soybeans early, you might have got all your corn planted early and, and then you would have been planting soybeans in May instead of corn. And, and ironically, the last two years, that would have worked out better from the standpoint of getting a stand of corn. Now, what would be better for the actual yield of your overall farm, you know, is, is kind of hard to say. You know, we're gaining on the corn, we're losing on the soybeans, you may end up back in the same spot. Uh, replanting is always frustrating. Soybeans can handle those wet, saturated soil conditions a lot better than corn can. So, you know, had we been planting soybeans in some of those tough windows in May, there probably would have been less replanting of soybeans than there was replanting of corn. Um, in, in some cases, it, it feels like we were, if you didn't have your corn done, you, you were really feeling pressure to get it in. And so when we got into that early May window, you know, a lot of guys kind of flipped the switch and gave corn priority at that point if you weren't done with corn. And, you know, ironically, um, you know, soybeans planted in that window probably would have taken the stress better than the corn did. So, you know, logistically, you know, we, we can't ever get everything done on the right day when you're doing it. You don't even know what the right day is. We only know what the right day is after it's done. And so it's really hard to, you know, know when you should push it hard, know when you should slack off uh, because it's not going to end well for you. Um, you know, I, I'm not a big one to recommend not planting when it's fit because of the weather forecast. Um, you know, I, I think in some cases that, you know, if, if, if the bad weather is short lived, that, that's okay. But if the bad weather persists for a month, well, then it gets really late on you. And, and you could have had that crop in the ground. So uh, I think there's a lot of different schools of thought on when it comes to planting. It's, it's really easy for people like me to talk about what you should do. What you should do to me is whatever feels right to you. And then just recognize that we never know when we do something, whether it's the right thing to do or not. And, you know, I'm going to err on the side of you're, you're a farmer, your job in the spring is to put your crop in the ground. So, that, that's the way I'm going to air is, you know, when it's fit within reason, we should probably be planting. And, and I think, you know, the last two springs have kind of reinforced that. And, it, and I'm a little bit scared that, you know, we'll, we'll go too far to, to the extreme of either pushing it early or pushing it too early or pushing marginal conditions early. Um, because in some cases, guys that have, waited for the right soil, the right calendar date, and the right weather forecast, uh, still aren't done planting. And, and that's, a, that's a painful spot to be in. So <clears throat> interesting season we've had so far. You, you ran a good synopsis of it earlier, like I said, Lance, uh, with the weather that we've been having, fighting some moisture issues, fighting some cooler wet conditions. Mm -hmm. That's really done a lot for um, interesting things going on out in the field, particularly in corn, also in beans to right. some, some extent. Right. You know, uh, a lot of guys asking me as you're driving down the road, they're looking at their corn, looking at everybody else's corn. They're seeing all kinds of different colors, all right. kinds of different, right. uh, you know, almost yeah. jokingly, 
it's like right now the world we're living in, why does my corn look like it has COVID? Yes, you know, yeah. if things don't look nice and even and yeah. beautiful and yeah. green. So right, right. there's a lot of different ways uh, and things going on out there, a lot of different ways we could go with this conversation. But I'll start it out with why does my corn look like COVID and let you have the floor as to what right. you're seeing primarily in your right. in your area over here right. in West Central Illinois, what what's going on? Right. Well it it the appearance of the crop and I and I haven't been in your territory, Adam. I would I would guess if we got down towards Quincy, I'd find some stuff that looks a lot better than what I'm used to looking at around here. So it's it's somewhat related to planting date, somewhat related to and and largely related to weather. Uh, what the appearance of the crop looks like. If you travel, travel down towards Springfield, you know, haven't had as much rain at certain times in the spring, got things in earlier as a general rule. We're drier early. We're actually borderline too dry at times early. And and really, if you want to get a crop off to a good start in Illinois, you, you want to be in a drought in the spring uh, is generally what works best for us. So the parts of the state that have been drier, that got in earlier, and didn't have some of the lengthy delays, you know, have the prettiest crop right now. But really the main thing that's driving those uneven fields and those tough areas in the fields, and you drive by that field and go, God, I just wish that thing looked better, it is drainage or, or lack thereof. And your well-drained parts of the field uh, are gonna be where your best looking crop is, and your wettest parts of the field, in some cases, is a bare hole that you're gonna go back in and spot in at some point or maybe the wet part of the field is a 25,000 uneven, pretty ugly, I'm gonna leave it because it's June, but I ain't happy with it, kind of kind of stand. And, and there's everything in between. So if, you're, if your drainage situation was severe enough and your soil saturation was such and the crop and the timing of the planting with the saturation, that seed suffocated, you know, you got a bare hole. If the crop was up, you know, you've probably got stunted corn in that spot, unless it was ponded long enough that it drowned out, and now you've still got a bare hole, but it's smaller than it would have been, you know, had it not been up. And then in many cases, you don't have a bare spot, but you've got corn there that's two leaves behind the rest of the field, about three shades lighter green, and just not as nice a stand as the better drain parts of the field. And, and that's just due to the fact that it's been in a basically since it was planted, it's been in a soil that was wetter and in many cases cooler than ideal. Uh, wet is the main problem versus cool. And in fact, in some cases, if we'd have been warmer, I think we would have killed more seeds in some cases because the coolness allowed this plant to get through the oxygen um, depleted you know, period better than it would have been if it would have been in a 75 or 80 degree soil, it would have just died faster. Um, so moisture is the main thing. Soil type changes are very, very noticeable. Um, oftentimes the soil type change is what's causing the difference in drainage. So if you've got a, a lighter timber soil that just tends to stay wet, if you've got a heavier clay that tends to stay wet, if you're farming a lot of side hills like I do, and it's wet enough that there's literally an artesian well running out of the side of the hill in your field, you know, you, you, no guessing as to what's wrong with the corn when there's water running out the, the soil, you know, where the corn's growing. If there's any corn there at all, it's somewhat miraculous that it was able to get up and it's still there, it's still alive. And when we get some oxygen in that soil and it finally gets a, a root system established, that stuff's going to come around. It isn't going to be as good as the pretty parts of the field, but it'll get a lot better than it looks today. So, you know, no doubt we've probably had some, some nitrogen loss in, in some situations, but I don't think that's primarily what's driving the appearance of things today. I think what's driving the appearance of things today is, you know, age of the crop, root development, soil type, and, and all of that relates back to drainage. And um, I'm, I'm guessing the tile guys are still going to be super busy. Uh, because the, the, the well-tiled fields and the naturally well-drained soils um, and the fields that have some roll to it so that excess moisture could kind of get off, you know, that, that those are the pretty fields. And if you're farming ground that tends to lay wet just due to the soil type or due to the drainage, uh, especially if you didn't get that in early, stuff looks pretty tough. Yeah. And, you know, having conversations uh, similar to that with growers, I always 
challenge them if there is a way that they can go out there. I'm a big fan of ditching because we have mm -hmm. such large rainfall events that, mm -hmm. you know, surface water is as much of what we're fighting right. as anything right. because the soil is saturated. Right. So it sits there. Yeah. And uh, I highly recommend if you've got somewhere that you think you can ditch some surface water out to, yeah. that's something I really, really think does a lot of a lot of good yeah to get those soil dried up at the top yeah cu culturally that has never really been a thing you know in this part of the state if you get on 55 and head towards st louis get down around litchfield mm. you know everybody's ditching every field right. um and it's just something you do um you know we haven't really taken that approach I've, I've got a farm at home that we pattern tiled 10 years ago that has these pockets out there that are just low areas well you know if i cut six inches of soil off of this ridge and drifted it out into that hole, mm -hmm. it could surface drain away. Right. And, you know, that would be a lot more economical way to get rid of that water than it would be to, to split the middles on, on every tile line I've got out in the field. Right. Um, and, and in some cases you might need to do both on some of these soils that are just, I, I've got some, some ground that is just so tight uh, just because of the soil type, it's got slope to it. It doesn't, water can't set on it, but once it gets saturated, it just stays saturated. And you walk out there now, it, it smells like a, a sewer, basically. It's just got a sour smell to it. And, you know, no, 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 um, no surprise. There's no corn growing there. And, um, you know, we, we know why. Probably a little bit of that uh, green moss growing on yes, top of it. Yes, too. yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Usually accompanies that smell that you're speaking mm -hmm. of. Yeah, so, I'm trying to uh, increase my soil organic matter and, and <laughs> biological activity by growing moss on my soil. Um, hey, got a good question that came in from, cool. from someone that uh, addresses some things that we've got going on that we're going to talk about anyways. So right. There's been some bleaching on corn leaves yeah. and post-herbicide yeah. applications. Yeah. Uh, have you seen any yield reduction from this? And probably let's talk a little bit about what's causing that and what's... Uh, yeah, well, herbicides maybe a little bit more than others. Okay, good, great question. Appreciate that. And yeah, that was on that was on my list of things to talk about if we didn't get live questions. So, so those of you who know me know that you know I'm not going to end early if there's no live questions. I'm going to talk about something. So, not asking questions doesn't get you out of class early. So, you might as well ask questions, and then we're talking about things that you're interested in. So, several things that we could talk about there. The first one that I'm reminded of that I wanted to touch on has nothing to do with herbicide applications whatsoever, and that's what I call silver leaf. And silver leaf occurs when we have a near frost, which we had. When was that, Adam? Five, six nights ago, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think I, that's my, about right. my days run together. I, I can't remember, but the, there were a couple nights there. We got into the high 30s, mm -hmm. and and there was frost in northern Iowa. You right. probably heard talk about that. Um, can't I, you know a Mother's Day freeze is bad enough. I, I don't even want to think about Memorial Day freeze. That's uh, that's crazy. Uh, but we got close to that. And so when you're looking out across that cornfield, you see those silver leaves. Sometimes they've got a little bit of a twist to them. That's just a little bit of, uh, of, of tissue damage and injury that occurs from those really, really cool temperatures just on the borderline of, of, of frost. Uh, doesn't really hurt the plant any. Uh, I wouldn't hold off making a herbicide application because of that. It doesn't have anything to do with your herbicide application. Now, if you're if your nodes are stacked up really close and tight and you just used a, an ALS type chemistry, that might be chemical related. And if you've got bleach leaves, which is what our question came in, that's probably, and you applied an HPPD uh, type chemistry, uh, that's probably the, the flashing or the bleaching that we can see temporarily from that. And the reason we're seeing more, um, I would say, you know, crop response. I, you know, some people would say injury. Uh, injury implies it's hurting something. So I'm going to call it crop response for the moment. And we'll talk about is it hurting anything here in a minute. But, you know, what prevents a pesticide from getting into the leaf of the plant, uh, whether it's a weed or a crop, is the waxy cuticle on that leaf. And those waxy layers build up when you've had sunlight, dry conditions, and heat. Um, we haven't had any of those three. So the cuticle level, the waxy level, the waxy layers on those corn leaves is almost non-existent at this point. So whatever we spray on that corn, it's just mainlining right, right, right into that plant system. 
And, you know, a lot of our pesticides have some um, activity on the crop. If you get enough of it in that plant, then it has to metabolize it. So our HPPD chemistry, which would be uh, Laudus in our case, uh, the Callistos, um, Impact, you know, all those uh, balance is a pre-emergence um, HPPD chemistry. Uh, so a lot of HPPDs out there, very effective on water hemp, nice products, really good tools for us. Um, but they do have the ability to cause that flashing or that bleaching. Um, you know, hybrid can affect it as well. So some hybrids show it more than others. Um, the, you know, the, how hot your, your mix is, so how much oil you've got in it, uh, how much surfactants in it, how many other goodies you've got in the tank with it. Uh, are you applying a high rate of glyphosate with it? There's a lot of surfactant in glyphosate. Are you adding even more surfactant on top of that? Are you using maybe a residual product that, that might be an, an EC formulation, the, the emulsifiable concentrates? They're a very oily uh, chemical form, way to formulate herbicides, and those will, will heat stuff up as well. So generally speaking, everything is hotter than normal because there's really no waxy cuticle that has built up to any degree on the corn leaves. We're getting more product into the corn plant than we normally do. And so you're going to see more crop response than you normally do. Hopefully, there's also very little waxy cuticle on the weeds and we're getting really good efficacy in weed control. T typically, there's a correlation there. If you're getting a lot of crop response, you should be getting really good weed control as well. Uh, if you're not getting good weed control, then apparently the product you're using doesn't have very good efficacy on the particular weed. Because if you're getting a crop response, we should be getting good weed control as well. The other part of that question, does it hurt anything? Um, I'm going to go back to when uh, a competitive product first came out. Callisto was one of the first products on the market. I was a Monsanto guy at that time. We were launching around a pretty corn when that came out. And I'll be honest, we tried really hard to show that when you flash corn with, with a HPPD chemistry, you know, there's some yield effect there. Um, had a hard time finding one unless it was a misapplication, uh, overlap area, something really odd, really severe. So it looks bad. Um, it would be nice if it didn't happen, but I don't really know that there's a whole lot of yield effect to it. Um, you know, those are good chemistries. Um, you know, some of them tend to do it more than others. And the uh, nature of the formulation, how much oil, how much surfactant, how much uh, emulsifier is in that particular mix might influence the amount of that flashing that you see. So it may not be the active ingredient as much as it is what else is in there that is making that active ingredient hotter. So maybe you don't need to change active ingredients. Maybe you could just take out a little bit of something else to safen that up if you're worried about the visual look. I don't think there's a yield uh, impact. It's at least not, not one that I've ever been able to measure from that. Um, generally, it's a fairly short-lived situation. That plant can metabolize that product relatively quickly. And within a couple leaves, you should be seeing nice new growth coming out of the world, uh, new, new green growth or, or, or healthy looking tissue. Uh, if it persists longer than a leaf or two, you know, then I'd be a little bit concerned. But generally, the new growth coming out is green. And, and as soon as that growth is what you can, what you can see from the road, you know, that field's going to look pretty green, even though those older leaves might still have a, a little bit of uh, bleaching going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've definitely been seeing, you know, more herbicide response this year than in typical years. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> we've, we've got uh, another question that I had from a grower the other day, and it kind of relates back to this and goes back to the weather again, as always. Yeah. With GDU calculations, uh, where, where are we at on GDU calculations and... Why is it uh, similar to soybean, like we talked about earlier, you want to up your populations, right. lower your populations in corn when you're planting later. What's the deal with corn and being able to catch up yeah. when you're when yeah. you're planting late corn? Yeah. How's that work? I, 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 I love this topic. Um, I, I think there's, you know, there's questions about it. There's people that don't believe it. There's, there's people that misunderstand it. Um, you know, th this goes back to some work that was done at Purdue many, many, many years ago. And, and Dr. Nielsen and others at Purdue um, calculate when you plant corn after May 15th, 
um, and shave about 6.7 GDUs per day off of its development. So if you go through the subtract degree units from what it's going to take to get the way that's often described is late planted corn catches up and and the the um, the implication is that the corn knows it was planted late and the corn knows it needs to hurry up that's not the case um I, I, there's a fancy term jen maybe you know the term when, when you when you give human characteristics to animals and other things anthropomorphism that's there you go wow so say that again because i can't anthropomorphism okay so that's the word i'll give myself credit for knowing the word existed i just wasn't sure how to say it so so basically that that is giving something that is not capable of conscious thought the ability to have conscious thought so the corn crop doesn't know what day it was planted. The corn crop doesn't know what day it was going to freeze. The corn crop doesn't know how many GDUs it needs to get done. The corn crop is not making a conscious decision to grow faster. My theory as to why this uh, happens is it's it's an error in the GDU formula, in my opinion. Um, this is this is maybe a little bit out on a limb for me because this is not maybe widely accepted. I haven't seen any research done to prove this, but 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 track with me here. The way the GDU formula works is once you get to 86 degrees, it's capped at 86 degrees for the daily high. It doesn't take into account how many hours during that day was it 86 degrees. So if on say June 1st you get to 86 degrees and you were at 86 degrees for one hour and your nighttime low was 60, you can do the math on that and calculate how many heat units you got for that day. If on July 1st, let's say the high was 90, you don't get credit for four more degrees because it's capped at 86. And let's say your low is still 60. So in theory, you've got the same number of heat units accumulated on these two days according to the formula. However, what if on July 1st, it was 86 plus for 10 hours versus one hour? You accumulated a lot more heat units and a lot more growth on July 1st in this scenario, but the formula is going to tell you you got the same number of growing degree days in both of those days, even though you really didn't. So to, to make the math simple, we don't take all this into account. If we took all this into account, it would take you a you know half a day and a couple spreadsheets and, and some pretty high level math to figure out how many heat units you got on that day. And it's not worth the trouble. So we just use this simple, simple formula here. Well, the simple formula works on average throughout the entire growing season. But if you're only growing a crop in the warmest part of the growing season, we probably need a different formula because the formula we use is right for the average of the entire growing season. But it's probably not quite right if you're planting corn June 1st. So, so we could get into a, a debate or an argument over why it happens, but you know, you can safely assume that if you plant corn, let's say today's June 3rd, so let's say you're planting corn. I've got customers planting corn today, and you're planting a hybrid that's 2,800 GDUs to black layer. I looked this up the other day. From June 1st to normal first frost date, Monmouth, Illinois, we usually get 2,700 heat units. So 2,700 heat units, in theory, will not finish a 20, 2,800 heat unit hybrid. And 2,800 would be kind of your average 112, 113 day corn. However, because of this, what we were discussing there, corn growing faster, um, what's the word, Adam? Anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism. That's, that's, that's the word for this acid agronomist show, anthropomorphism. 
So if you take that, let's say 300 off of there, you know, you're essentially going to get that 2800 black layer hybrid done in 2500 heat units based on the way the formula calculates heat units. And so you got a 200 heat unit cushion planting that hybrid that in theory, you don't have enough heat units left to, to finish that hybrid. And, and this is a lot of the basis for why most agronomists will, agronomists will recommend that you stay with uncomfortably full season hybrids when you're planting late. Do not overreact and try to find some 90 or 95 day corn because, you know, 2700, you'd have to be down to like 106 or under to, to get done in 2700. But that 106 day hybrid is probably going to finish more like a 100 day hybrid, you know, by the time you take in this account, this adjustment. The actual data from Purdue, I think, is 6.7 GDUs per day. You can subtract after, I think, their date's May 15. So if you plant June 3rd, now the, the other thing I would say is you got to be a little bit. You use some common sense here too. You, you can't subtract 6.7 GDUs per day in October. It's only in the warm months that you can do that. So, so, so be careful with that. So, so June, June 3rd. So let's say you got June, July, and August. So the hot months of the summer. So you got roughly 90 days there. So if you take 90 times 6.7, you know, that's over 500 heat units. It's not going to gain up that much, you know. That's on six hundred three. Yeah, yeah. That, I, I wouldn't. I probably wouldn't ever subtract more than four hundred. You know, maybe if it was if it was me, um, because there is a limit to to how much gaining up we're going to do. But but that's you know that's probably deeper than some of you wanted to get into me explaining why this works the way that it does. Just understand that it does. It's widely accepted. Now, now the reason it works the way it does is, is probably debated. And, and people smarter than me probably know why I'm full of crap with my explanation. But that's, you know, that, that's my theory as to why it works this way. But you absolutely can still plant full season corn in central Illinois on June 3rd. And that is my recommendation. If you're still planting corn, I would not be planting anything under 110 if it was me. I was replanting 112 on my farm yesterday, um, you know, and, and I've got some customers that still got 115 day corn it loaded in the tender, loaded in the planter, can't return it. You know, that corn's still going in the ground and, and it will black layer. Now, if we have a 2009, you know, record cool summer, you know, all, all this is shot to you know what, because, you know, we're just not going to accumulate heat units. And if we have an early frost, you know, that changes things as well. Um, and, and you do know that when you plant 115 day corn, you know, June 3rd, it's most likely going to be wet unless we have a, you know, if it's not wet, we probably just had a really hot, dry summer and it's probably not going to be very good either. Um, but you know, if you've got a way to dry that crop reasonably economically, you're better off going for the bushels and there's going to be enough bushels with that full season corn typically, unless your drying costs are ridiculously high to offset, you know, the additional money you're going to spend on dry. Yeah, great explanation, Lance. Uh, that's always an interesting dynamic, trying to get through that conversation and depending on who you're talking to, what their take is on it, especially in the academic world. But anyway, yeah, which, which, I, which I'm not in, by the way. So <laughs> it's, it's a lot easier to have an opinion on stuff if you're not in the academic world. So um, I had a question that was texted in to me. And basically what it revolves around is how we had worse frost conditions earlier. Yes. You know, down the twenties. Yes. Yeah. How on earth did that affect our crop less yes. than these upper 30, yeah. Yeah. not technically even frosting conditions yes. that we had later on? Yeah. Yeah. I, sh I should have explained questions that the agronomist cannot answer are not allowed on Ask the Agronomist. <laughs> so so I, I, I'm right there with your customer. I, I'm, was astounded when I started getting calls about dead beans after that. I can't remember what date that was. The the, the May freeze that wasn't really a freeze. Yeah, I, I don't remember off uh, the top of my head either. Around the it's been probably 16th, 17th, maybe. I yeah, yeah. I'm I don't three, remember either. Three, four weeks ago, probably. Yeah. I would I would guess. So 
so yeah, we, we had a night there um, where the most of the weather reports were saying, you know, 34, 35 um, was about what we got down to. In theory, you know, it takes 28 degrees to kill soybeans. Corn, I, I've seen corn get ding pretty good at 34 or 35, so it's a lot easier to kill corn. Back in April, when we had the real freeze, you know, <laughs> hell around here, we were 26, 27. Now, you probably didn't get quite that cold. Um, we didn't have anything up to speak of back then. The only thing up around here was a March 10th planted soybean plot just for fun to see what happens when you plant beans really early. Those got smoked. They were they were black mush within two days of, of that freeze. So that didn't surprise me. We were below 28 for several hours and, and soybean shouldn't survive that. I have no explanation for uh, other than, you know, the weather station said it was 34 or 35. There must have been some pockets of air out there that were a hell of a lot colder than 34 or 35. Because mm -hmm. I'm going to stand on science and say that 34 or 35 will not kill soybean tissue no matter what kind of conditions it's been through. So the only thing I can explain is we, we must have had some colder air um, than, than what the weather station, you know, data picked up. Um, and it was very, very pockety. It was low areas. It was next to waterways. You could see in fields where there was a little bit of a ridge that stopped that mass of cold air from moving. It, it didn't get over the ridge. Yeah. I was in fields where on the other side of the ridge, it was lower elevation than it was where I was standing in the dead beans, but those beans were fine yeah. because yeah. the air came from somewhere else and it couldn't get over the rise. And so everything on the other side was protected. So saw some really, you know, intended to be lighter soils, higher residue. The the pattern of where the damage was was consistent with the way frost usually works. Mm -hmm. I too have a hard time explaining why we had so much of it at those temperatures. I do think there is a little bit of truth to the fact that if it's never been warm mm -hmm. and that plant is used to being miserably cold. Right. Have you have you ever watched Iron Will? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the first thing he starts his training, grandpa throws him outside in the wintertime. Yeah, He's got to get yeah. used to the cold. So, get acclimated. So, so, yeah. so, so, so anyway. They, they, uh, there's I, definitely I, something to that acclimation yeah. with how the sugars are stored in the plant and the dynamic of that. And then the other thing too that I speculate because I don't have a really precise and good answer myself, but you know, later on, maybe maybe the ground had been more mm. saturated, so there was less yeah. thermodynamic radiation right. coming from the ground. Possibly, you've got a plant that typically it's, is a little farther away from the ground. Right, the right. right. A little bit more. Yeah, exposed. the bigger the bigger the plants are, the harder they always take a freeze, and yeah. so so that would definitely be a difference. Yeah. But but I I still I still will will stand by my belief that if it was really only thirty five, it wouldn't have done that. I don't care how cold the soil is or how wet the soil yeah. is or how big the plant is or, or how used to warm weather it was. There had to be some pockets of colder air out there. No, oh, I, I completely agree. And, you know, I'm grasping at all the little micro straws yeah. that I can to try yeah. to explain it with, you know, water gradients and all that stuff in the yeah. plant. So yeah. it was a good question and a good conversation. That's for yeah. sure about that particular yeah. nuance, if you will. <laughs> um, you know, something that we're seeing a lot of this year still again we've seen it past years and big time this year is sulfur mm. implications yeah yeah uh, particularly in corn uh, if you've got any sulfur trials going on yeah. uh, in the area i challenge you to go look at them and not be yeah. amazed by it because right there's definitely a, a huge response there you seeing the same thing in yep. your area yeah yeah definitely and and i've you know i've been a big sulfur believer for for several years it's uh it's our fourth biggest macronutrient. It's not a micro. It's one of my pet peeves. People refer to sulfur as a, as a micro. Uh, after NPK, sulfur is next as far as total pounds required. And it's not grams or ounces. It's pounds and quite a few pounds that the plant requires. Um, and, and really, it needs to be part of, I think, every fertility program on corn, soybeans, wheat, Wheat's probably the most visual crop. Corn would be close to wheat. Soybeans are not quite as visual, but really all of our crops probably want more sulfur than they're able to get out of the soil. 
especially when the soil is cold and wet and especially when it takes a while for that soil to warm up in the spring. Um, the other thing I'm seeing a lot of too is when we're putting our sulfur out in our typical dry fertilizer blends, some of the sulfur product doesn't fly quite as far as the P and K does. And so I, I see some spread patterns out there as well. You know, maybe you're spreading 80 feet, but the sulfur is only going 65. And so you end up with a little 10 foot yellow streak on, on the edge of, of each pattern. So uh, that's a little bit volume related. I tend to see that more often in VRT applications where maybe we're VRT in something and, and the volume gets pretty low out there and there's just not enough carrier there to carry the sulfur out to the, to the edge of the pattern. So, um, you know, a lot of different sulfur products available, a lot of different ways to use sulfur. Uh, none of them are as cheap as they used to be. Um, you know, if you, if you haven't noticed, fertilizer prices are, are kind of responding to um, uh, other economic factors going on out there. But, you know, even without the recent increases, um, you know, sulfur used to be kind of a waste byproduct and there wasn't a lot of people using sulfur and there was a lot of abundant supply out there. Um, but it's, it's a, you know, it's an important nutrient for our crops. Uh, we need it and, um, you know, it needs to be part of, of your program. And I think if you're doing any rate studies with sulfur this year, you're probably going to see, um, better responses from higher rates as well. So, so my, my two challenges to you would be, are you using sulfur? And if you are, are you using enough? And, and if you're not using it, you, you need to start. And if you decide you're not using enough, then we need to use more. And, um, you know, I think it is, it is the most visual of our nutrients, more than nitrogen. If you want to make corn look pretty, don't put more nitrogen on it, put sulfur on it. Um, now, it's not always an economic response just because you see the visual response. Um, so you can't necessarily say that if you're, if you're seeing a huge response visually that that's going to translate to yield. But, you know, the, the number one nutrient deficiency I see in corn every year is sulfur. And number two is, is potassium. Um, nitrogen would be third. So, so we get every time we see corn that's not green, you know, everybody's head goes to nitrogen. Um, it's more likely sulfur that's making it not be green. Uh, fairly easy to diagnose. Sulfur is going to give you the, the, the striping on the leaf. And you're going to have... So here's, here's your green veins. You're going to have yellow in between the green veins. And, and that's very pronounced in the corn leaf. Uh, sulfur is not mobile in the plant. So it can't take it from the old leaves and give it to the young leaves. So the sulfur deficiency is going to show up on the new growth. It's going to make the field look yellow from the road. But if you walk out there, the veins are still green. The old leaves are still green and the new leaves are striped. Um, they're not really all yellow. It's just the in between the veins, the intervenal chlorosis, we call it, um, that's making that plant look yellow from a distance. So uh, under 10 minute warning here for everybody. If you got some questions, try to get them into us. You can obviously submit them via YouTube, text your rep. Uh, you can text Lance. We may not get to it, but we'll get back to it. There's Twitter. You can post it on Twitter. We'll get to it that way. So get your questions in. But one thing that we've got to cover, it's uh, beginning of June here, and we can't not have asked the agronomist talk about soybean post application mm -hmm. herbicide, um, especially with some of the dates and deadlines that we've got right. coming up. Right, right. So our, our next, uh, by the time we're back together again, it's going to be what, June 17th, if my math is, is right. So we'll be getting real close to the June the, the magical day of June 20th, if you're managing dicamba in, in Illinois. Uh, so, you know, if you're, you know, planning to use dicamba post in your extend or extend flex soybeans, we've got about 17 days left to do that. Uh, some of those 17 days will not be good spray days, as we know. And, you know, my rule of thumb is uh, you're, you're better off to be too early than too late. Uh, with your soybean post-emergent application. Um, I think that's true of all herbicide systems. It's probably even more true of the dicamba-based programs. So, you know, keep in mind that, you know, if your beans are that tall and the field is clean, 
that's a good time to spray a post. If we're using additional residual in that application like we should be for good weed resistance management, we want that residual to be applied and activated before your true pre-residual completely plays out. That's the concept of overlapping residuals, which, which really, really helps take some of the weight off of your post-emergence products from having to control all the weeds if we can get 80 or 85 or maybe even 90 percent of our weeds controlled with with pre-emergent products this puts a lot less selection pressure on the post products so so some some other things to keep in mind you know how are you going to manage volunteer corn in these post-emergence applications are you going to try to some some people are trying to adopt the philosophy of i don't care i'm not going to mess with controlling volunteer corn that, that's easier to do now than it is to live with that decision in august so, so be careful if, if that's the decision you make, because once you decide that that was a, not a good decision, it's kind of hard to fix at that point. So, so things you want to think about with volunteer corn control is there, there is antagonism, and this is, this is unfortunate, but if you're doing everything else right, using dicamba, using residuals, especially a group 15 residual like a warrant, uh, or any other group 15 product um, that is going to antagonize volunteer corn control. And so we need to be at the upper end of the rate range with those volunteer corn products. And in some cases, we probably need some additional crop oil uh, in that mix because that's what makes that product work good. There's a lot of surfactant and glyphosate, but those volunteer corn products respond better to crop oil than they do to surfactant. So in some cases, getting that rate up getting that corn controlled when it's small, maybe some additional adjuvants in some cases uh, to overcome the antagonism from the other products that we need to have in the tank to do a good job on the rest of the weeds. But unfortunately that makes it harder to get, to get volunteer corn. But um, you know, we've got a lot of post-emergent work to do. There's a ton of corn that needs sprayed. And in most of my territory, most of the corn hasn't even been posted yet. Nobody's posting beans. And, and we need to magically be able to get all that done in the next uh, two weeks, roughly. And um, so if, you're, if, you're, if your applicator calls you and says, hey, I want to spray your field, the words, it's too early, the crop's too small, should not come out of your mouth. Let them spray your field. No doubt. We got just a couple more minutes here um, before we're ready to wrap up. Anything else in on the chat, Adam, or anything on your mind? Oh, we just had one come in. Cool. Oh, there's always one sneak yep. in under yeah, the wire. Yeah, right at the last minute. Uh, Leighton Peterson, thanks for the question, says, if a grower is seeing a sulfur deficiency, how would you recommend correction for that? Is there an in-season solution that is economical? Okay. So, great, great question. Um, I, I'm not a big proponent of trying to rectify a sulfur deficiency in season. Now, there are ways you can do it. You can broadcast sulfur into standing crop. They've done that on sandy soils for years. Uh, you can side dress liquid. So if you're gonna be side dressing nitrogen, you can side dress sulfur right along with it. Um, I, I'm not gonna promise you that there's an economic response to doing that. Now on sandy soil, there probably is because sand has virtually no sulfur in it. So on a sandy soil, that's kind of a different situation. But if you're on a, a typical soil, and I, I should have said this earlier, there's a correlation between organic matter level and the ability of the soil to su supply sulfur. So if you've got a 4% organic matter soil that's showing some sulfur deficiency, that's temporary. You know, you just don't have a good enough root system under that corn. We haven't mineralized enough sulfur out of organic matter. That sulfur's coming. I don't think in that scenario it would really ever pay to put on additional sulfur in season. The lighter your soil is, the less sulfur the soil is going to supply. And if you're in a really extreme situation and the corn's still fairly small, there might be some scenarios. Probably depends on the price of the corn, which is good. Price of the sulfur's you know going to kind of offset the price of the corn a little bit because the fertilizer cost is going to be high. Um, but that's all, that's an opportunity to do some testing. I, you know, being an agronomist, I, I love to do trials. So if you do have a field that has some, some deficiency symptoms showing up and you want to try to address it, uh, I would say either, you know, liquid side dress or dry broadcast like ammonium sulfate. Don't use elemental sulfur. Um, it's, it's cheap. 
but it won't be available in time to help this year's crop. Uh, and I would say don't try to address it foliarly either. There's some foliar products that have sulfur in them. I'm not saying they're bad products, but it's virtually impossible to supply enough of a macronutrient through a foliar to, to have a big response. So the main thing I would recommend in that scenario is let's see what we need to address in our dry fertility program to you know do a better job in the future rather than throwing a bunch of money at it trying to fix this year. If you want to try that, uh, do some testing, see, see what kind of response you get. But generally speaking, I, I prefer to use those deficiency symptoms to give me clues as to what I need to change in my fertility program for the future, rather than spend a bunch of money trying to fix the problem that I see today. Because by the time we can address that deficiency, um, it, it's probably going to be too late to impact yield significantly. Good question. Well, hey, we're just about out of time here. I'd like to encourage everybody to like, if you like these types of chats and you like the information on our West Central Illinois YouTube page, like it, uh, subscribe to the channel, hit the little notification bell so that whenever we post something to the YouTube channel, you, you get a notification on your phone. You can watch what's going on. Be sure to leave a, a chat, you know, uh, ask a question, it'll it'll yeah. notify us and we can get back to it on the next Ask the Agronomist session or we can answer it in the chat Yeah. Uh, also. So yeah, if it's, you know, if it's an important question, we, we won't make you wait two weeks for the next Ask the Agronomist to answer your question. We'll, we'll always answer questions. But uh, if you do have suggestions for topics, you know, things that you think we ought to talk about on Ask the Agronomist, drop those in my email. If you've got feedback, um, you know, if you, if you want to see a different agronomist on Ask the Agronomist, let me know. Uh, we'll we'll find we'll find a better one. So uh, appreciate everybody's uh, involvement and participation, and your involvement and participation is what makes this good. Uh, because you know, just me standing up here talking about what I think you need to know about might have a little bit of value, but I would much rather talk to you about things that uh, you're interested in, that you care about, that are impacting your your operation today. So that's why we want the questions. That's why we want the the interaction. And I think it just makes it better for everybody. So appreciate I, that. I had one last little quick question. Hopefully we can answer it fairly soon. Been seeing some bean leaf beetle damage out there. Okay. Question is about it. Um, what's the threshold we need to be worried about with spraying bean leaf beetle yeah. at this point? Yeah. So, I mean, the threshold's very high. Um, I think uh, it's probably 30% defoliation, yeah. which, which I honestly have never, I don't know that I've ever seen that uh, early in the season. Now, I, I do think that there is a detriment to, you know, seedling soybeans from bean leaf beetle feeding. I think that's one of the reasons we see a yield advantage to the high rate of that, uh, that's in um, our seed treatment and Acceleron. Uh, if you don't have any neonic insecticide in your seed treatment, so you're using maybe a straight fungicide, or, you know, we've had some beans been in the ground for, hell, Adam, you've had beans in the ground for two and a half months now. Uh, there's, not a, there's not a whole lot of uh, insecticide left from that seed treatment. So if, if the bean, beetle, bean, uh, bean leaf beetle feeding is severe enough, um, you know, in theory, um, there is uh, a reason to control them. But if you look at any established threshold, it's pretty high. I mean, a 30% fed on, you know, a lot of times the bad leaf might be approaching 30%, but the plant is nowhere near 30% defoliated. I don't think most growers could stand to let it get to 30% before they're going to want to do something because 30% is really, really bad um, visually. You know, I'm not saying the yield loss at 30% is even that great, but um, you know, it's got to be pretty bad. We're talking every leaf Swiss cheese uh, with almost as much leaf missing as still there. Um, before you reach what's kind of an established university threshold. Uh, I, I do think there are scenarios where we get yield responses uh, out, of, out of being a little more aggressive um, with our treatments, but um, you know, it, it would need to be pretty severe before I would you know, go out there just to control bean leaf beetle. Now, if you're gonna be there with a herbicide or doing something else anyway, and, and your, your label will allow the tank mix of the insecticide in with that, save you the trip cost and all you're gonna have in it's, you know, three or $4 worth of pyrethroid. You know, that's about a third of a bushel of beans these days. So 
it, it's not difficult to get an extra third of a bushel of soybeans uh, from controlling a pest. So if that's the scenario you're in, you know, might, might be worth looking into. Awesome. Thanks, Lance. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Just a reminder, again, hit like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And by all means, if you like this sort of content and information, you know, share it with your friends, let them know how to get on it. And uh, or if you need help as to how to share the link, ask your rep, ask your agronomist, so we can help you get that stuff done. But thanks again. And we will be back on the 17th of June with the next Ask the Agronomist. Thanks, everybody.